Welcome to another episode of Stardust and Golden. Uh, today is a um, extension or a third installment of a series on um, the sailboat uh, toolbox. Uh, I keep forgetting certain tools. I've had some requests for some tools. Uh, and I was also notified by a couple people to give a demonstration on some of the tools that weren't that common that you, you know may not have used before. Uh, my friend Nicole from Saddles and Sales mentioned that you know it'd be a good idea to demonstrate the uh, hand impact, uh, which is a good idea because not everybody's used or even seen these. So if you're a new sailor or new with using tools, this is a, a really good item. And I mentioned this in video number one, uh, how important this is to have on a boat uh, since you don't have air or the access to um, power tools. So I'm going to start off. I'm going to give a demonstration on this at the end of this video. So if there's, um, if you want to fast forward, you could. Uh, but I'm going to go over a lot of stuff in this in this episode here uh, that I missed in the last two, hopefully. And there's a couple things I want to clear up from an episode where I had um, was not clear on a couple things. So, anyways, uh, first thing I want to do is clear up. Something that I mentioned in episode one, I believe it was, on screwdrivers. Now, there was a, um, I had mentioned the Posi drive and the Phillips and how closely related they are. They look like the same screwdriver. And oftentimes you can strip out a bolt or a um, screw by using the wrong one. And I have done that in the past before. Now, Posi drive is mostly used on machinery, some engines, but mostly stuff that's built in the UK or Canada. It's not real common in the States and not real common in some of the European countries. So it's not something you have to be worried about unless you have something that was possibly built in the UK. And then you might need um, posi drives and often a whole set of wrenches for that particular type of machinery too because sometimes they use um, ASE and British Standard or Whitworth wrenches and sockets. So that's another topic altogether. Now, the difference between the Phillips that I forgot to mention in the first episode is although they look exactly the same, there's a slight machining difference inside and it could cause trouble if you use the wrong screwdriver and the wrong screw. The posi drive though is usually always identified by four radiating lines in the top of the screw like that. So if you see those lines, there's a good chance that that's a posi drive. Now the screwdrivers and the bits are usually always marked with a PZ or a Z, they'll have identification to let you know that it's a posi drive and not a Phillips screwdriver. Even the small little bits will have a Z or a PZ carved into the side of the, or stamped in, or sometimes they're laser etched. So keep your eyes open for that too, because when you buy sets with the screwdriver bits in them, there's usually always posi drives in there. You don't want to accidentally pick that up mistakenly for a Phillips, put it inside of a bronze screw, and the next thing you know, it's rounded out, it's done. So be really careful and alert for that. Okay, one thing I didn't mention in the last series, uh, series one or two, was wrenches. I don't believe we talked wrenches. Wrenches are very important. Now, on a really large boat, you have the option to carry a large toolbox or a huge set of tools. You can have three or four or five sets of screwdrivers. It's fine. However, uh, screw um, just like everything else on a boat, there's a compromise in every tool you have. If you have a smaller boat and you can only buy one set of screwdrivers, buy really good ones. Medium length, you're going to have to buy the long or the short because you don't have the options anymore if you're pressed on room and weight. Wrenches are the same deal. If you've got to buy one set of wrenches, buy medium length, not the short, not the long, and six point box end. Uh, one end. These are combination wrench. One end's open one end's boxed. You want a medium length combination wrench with the 15 degree angle at one end. Now most wrenches all come with that 15. It's kind of a standard in wrench manufacturing. You don't want to buy the straight machine wrenches, uh, but you want one with the 15 degree. You can see the slight bend there. Okay. Now the offset on this, there's full of 15 degree bends on a wrench. There's 15 degrees right here too on this offset. And also, and this is something that's very, very important. The stamped in hole or machined hole is usually always offset 15 degrees. Uh, and that's for getting in tight spaces. If you have a six point wrench, 
And the compromise here is that you don't get as much swinging room to place the wrench on the bolt. You've only got every 60 degrees in a 360 circle instead of 30 degrees, okay? So in a slight demonstration here, if you're gonna put this on a, a bolt and you only had this top area to work with, you have right there at that position, you got that position, and you got that position. There's only three positions there. Now, if that's just a 12 point, you got a six. The problem with that is you don't have the surface area or the gripping power. So one thing about the offset on this, being 15 degrees off, if, if, if you have a little working room with your hand and the wrench really, you don't have enough space to get it on, let's say you're right in this area. Well, if you flip this wrench around, it'll go right on. Okay, so you do have options just by turning the wrench over if you have the working room with your hand. But I say six point, and here's the compromise. You don't have the working area, but you have a lot more surface area on the nut, okay? If you're fixing your old Ford tractor on your farm and you break a round out a nut or you break a wrench, the risk aren't really that great as they are on a boat, okay? You've got the choice. You could call your brother-in-law up your next door neighbor, borrow a tool, run down to the hardware store, the big box store, buy another tool at your convenience. Uh, on a boat, you really can't, if you're in the Southern Ocean or even in the Great Lakes, trying to get into a, a, a um, port and something breaks on your engine, you want a tool that's going to be there and it's going to work. Okay, if you start rounding out bolts because you, you've got a cheap wrench and a 12 point, a 12 point wrench, and you got old rusty bolts on your engine, you're trying to replace a water pump before you hit port, you're going to need something that's good and that has integrity. Um, not a cheap junk wrench from a, uh, a big box store because sometimes uh, that wrench could be light. Out on the farm, it doesn't matter. You can just go down to the hardware store at your convenience, replace the bolt, replace the wrench, and you're off and running. On a boat, you don't have that option. The wrists don't add up the same. Uh, it could be life or death out there. So uh, the quality of your tools really does matter. Uh, because you don't have the option of running down to the hardware store anymore. I suggest to a lot of people, hey, go down to the big box store if you're working on your car or your motorcycle in your backyard or fixing a lawnmower. Sure, because you could replace these tools at your convenience. But on a boat, it's pay now or pay later. And sometimes the price later is much bigger. It could be a major accident. Here's an example. This came out of a set. It was probably a $6 set from a big box store. A buddy of mine um, by the name of Bob, I spoke to him on the phone just yesterday and he says, you know, he says, you gotta remind people that, you know, when it comes to, you can find a good boat in a harbor, okay? Now this is kind of cryptic here, uh, but don't go to any place called harbor for your tools on a boat. This came from a place, I don't really wanna say their name, but you can figure it out. This, was try, I was trying to roll a roll pin out of a shaft. Not a lot of force. And I hit this with a hammer about three times and it just bent like that. Not only that, the top mushroomed out about 15 thousandths of an inch. And just two hits, it was done. Now it's guaranteed. Well, guarantee is great because I did this at home and I could just go down to the store 10 miles away and replace it at my convenience. Out on the water, this would have been a disaster. Number one, it won't fit in the hole anymore because it expanded. Number two, it bent. It was probably going to break on the next hit. So it would be better for me to spend $6 on one of these than spend $6 on a cheap set of six or seven of these in a set. So it's buy now, pay now, or pay later. And sometimes you pay triple later. So just buy the good one up front because the risk, again, they just don't add up the same. And you don't want to be out in a seaway in the Straits of Magellan and all of a sudden find out that you've got to fit, repair your shaft and all your tools are garbage. It's bad. It's really bad. So anyways, to carry on here, uh, I suggest six-point wrenches if you're only going to have one set. You can have two sets. Yeah, 12-point or even ratchet wrenches are okay. Don't use ratchet wrenches as your only set, though. Ratchet wrenches... Um, they're great wrenches. I, I, I use them all the time. I love them dearly, but I don't keep them on my boat. 
And the reason for that is I've seen them just in working environments on land uh, where the poles and the springs will seize up inside from rust. Just the humidity in the atmosphere will rust them up to a point where they, they won't work at all and all of a sudden you have a locked up box wrench. It's no longer a ratchet wrench. So if that's, um, you can have those for a backup. They're great to have, they're convenient. You know, it's like using a ratchet, takes the nuts right off. Uh, as your only set of wrenches, I have to say, no way. You're going to really regret that decision. And again, everything on a boat's a compromise, including the boat, the design, the sails, the rigging, no matter what you have on a boat, what you can possibly conceive of is going to be a compromise. And these wrenches are the same thing. So do not forget that. Take the best compromise you can with your tools. Okay, Spend wisely here. You don't have to go spend a million dollars on your toolbox. You know, you don't need a huge one. Just use a little bit of wisdom and knowledge and stuff that some people have gone before that have done and made the mistakes and follow their mistakes. Okay. Another thing to have on a boat that's, that I find important, a lot of people don't, is a tapered reamer. I will have to give a demonstration on this too. This is actually for taking a smaller hole and making it slightly bigger without stepping up drills. If you're in a real hurry, you can take this, put it in. This one's broke. The tip broke off there because it wasn't a really, really good one. I'll hide the name there. But um, this, the tip broke off, but this would go down to about a sixteenth of an inch, and I could ream the hole out if I really want to sit there for a long time all the way to half inch. On an aluminum mast, if you have limited drill bits, and you need a quarter inch hole to tap out and you only have a sixteenth inch drill bit, this might help you in that situation. You could just slightly keep tapping this out and um, reaming it out until it gets to the size where your tap will fit in. So it's something to have on a boat. I would consider it. A good one's about $12, so it's not that bad. Don't buy the $3 ones. You're going to regret it. It's going to end up in the drink and you're going to be very angry. All right, uh, another thing to have is any kind of spring or hook puller like this one here. It's got a small hook at the end. Now, this is for springs. There's not a whole heck of a lot of them on a boat. My springs rot out by nature, uh, but it's great to have if you have to pull anything or wires through a mast. Um, it's just a great tool to have. This one here, I can recommend these guys because they make a lot of tools. They're really good, but you'll have to find them on the internet because they don't sell retail. You have to buy them from another store, but it's called Motion Pro, okay? M most motorcycle shops carry Motion Pro products, so you can find these if you're really after anything. They make a lot of specialty tools that are really high quality, and they're, they won't break the bank. So Motion Pro is one I can recommend. And bits for either a socket wrench or the hand impact. Buy the good ones. Don't buy the cheap ones. You've got to buy really good ones of these. You're not going to get these in a big box store. They're going to break, shatter on you, and you're going to be very angry. You're going to be out at sea missing a tool that you desperately need. Okay. These, uh, this is a number three and a number two, three-eighths socket bits. Okay. They work their weight in gold. You've got to have these on a boat because there's uh, Phillips and I would get them in the straight too. Um, the Phillips and straight of these. They're all over on a boat, and usually they're seized up, especially if you're in salt water or the boat's older. You're going to need those. Okay. Stay away from these. This is a double open-ended wrench. It's straight. You'll see there's no 15-degree angle on one of them. Uh, if you have a really large boat and you can carry, <coughs> excuse me, lots of tools, it's okay. But do not buy one of these or a set of these as your only set of wrenches. You're really going to be in a place of regret. All right. <clears throat> Some things that are not tools that you should have on your boat too. Duct tape, always bright colored if possible, because by the time you need this, you're usually in an emergency anyway, and you want somebody to see it, or you need to see it. Uh, especially if you have any broken studs on the boat, anything you don't want people falling off, you can at least identify it. You know, the bright green, yellow, orange, red uh, duct tape. So if you have stanchions that are broken in half from you know doing a pitch pole or rollovers. You can put some tape on it, at least in the meantime, so people can see it and know, hey, I don't want to fall on that. It's going to cut my side wide open. Okay. Another thing to have, epoxy. I can give you this. I'm going to go ahead and plug these guys because this is a really excellent product. It's probably top shelf. This is the long dry. They do make it in a five minute, I believe, or a quick dry. It's a two-part epoxy, and it's great for emergencies. This stuff is really strong. If you have the time 
I would say get the 24 hour. It's much better. It takes 24 hours to set, uh, but the strength is unbelievable. You can actually tap it too. I mean, you, you, you can put a bolt right through it. You can drill it out, tap it, run a bolt through it. It's great stuff. I swear by it. Another thing, uh, sandpaper you want to have, but not actual sandpaper, but sanding cloth. It's like a, um, it almost looks like a steel grid. Uh, with sandy material on it. They hold up well in water. Sometimes, um, I'd say emery, emery cloth will hold up a little bit in the water. Uh, there's also, um, what would you call it, uh, scotch Bright pads. Some of those will hold up really well. Those are really necessary on a boat, whether you're at the dock or whether you're out at sea. There's always a chance, time where you're going to need that stuff, especially if you're cleaning a shaft or you're putting in new um, plaques. Uh, packing uh, at a shaft packing, uh, you really need to clean that shaft up well. I don't recommend a heavy grit there. I would say, you know, double zero, maybe uh, brass wool. Don't use steel wool on a boat. The stuff just rots right out, it turns to rust and out, stains everywhere just from the dust. As soon as you use it, the dust falls into the bilge, turns brown. It's a done deal. Um, use brass wool if you can find it. It comes in different uh, grades too, just like steel wool does. And it's really good to have on a boat. It doesn't rot out and turn to a big rust ball on you. So here's something that a lot of people don't uh, have on their sailboat, but I highly recommend it uh, for emergency use. It's a bottle of nail polish. And here's why. This stuff is fuel resistant. Okay. If you have a small leak in the fuel system, you can dry that leak off. And this will sometimes help. It also helps if you have a carbureted engine. There's still a few of them out there with gasoline uh, sailboat engines, the old Atomic 4s and some of those with pure gasoline. And if you're replacing a float needle and seat in those, this is the best thing to put the float needle and seat in. Well, not the needle, but the seat itself. When you press the seat in or screw the seat in, you put this one on it because it doesn't dissolve in gasoline and it will last for years. It also, because I use a heavy metallic, this actually can be used as a small gasket surface on a small item. If it's a machined surface, the aluminum filings that are in this will actually seal up and make a small gasket if you need it. I also use it for all the screws on adjustments. So if you have several adjustments on whatever it is, steering uh, on the engine, I know our engine has a um, idle screw and a maximum throttle screw, maximum RPM. So if you put this on it, you can mark it. So if a mechanic's ever in there and tampers with it, you could tell right away, just a little bit of a drop on it, right where the threads meet the um, metal. And you'll be able to see if it's ever tampered with. And it also acts like a um, thread lock. So if you needed a thread lock and you don't have any, you know, um, uh, blue or the red, um, what do they call it, Permatex uh, stuff on your boat, uh, this is the best thing to have to, to back up. So if you don't have it, this is a, a good thing to have. I use, um, I forget the brand of it, uh, but I believe it was a, a Permatex. I can, I can plug them here too, uh, a thread locker. And I think I use um, the blue because the blue is designed to come undone. It's not a permanent thread lock. So... I, I always use the blue and it's color coded for its purpose. So the blue seems to be the best for overall. If you want to take something apart again, the blue. This is another very important thing. I blocked the name, uh, but uh, I probably didn't have to. This is an anti seize compound. Uh, this stuff is great and you really need it where there's dissimilar metals. You're putting stainless steel screws into your mast and your mast is aluminum. This is the thing to have um, to, to isolate the screw. It also helps. Uh, if you put the, I put it on every engine bolt that I ever take off so I can get the thing back off again. This will prevent it from corroding. The gold is better. Somebody told me that 30, 40 years ago. I don't know what the chemical difference is. I never studied it, but I tried the gold because I was calling their bluff. It says, no, there's, there's really no difference between the silver and the gold anti-seize compound. Uh, I started using the gold and found out that after years of use, I could take the bolt back out. It came out a lot easier. The silver tends to harden up after a while. I don't know how it will react in salt in the tropics either. I have no idea because I have not used this down there. So I would uh, stick with the gold because I have a lot more faith in that. But 
Either one's good, especially on engine components. Just put a little bit of this on the threads when you reassemble, and you'll be glad you did if you ever have to take that part back off again, because the chances are it will come right off. If you're doing this with a manifold, um, whether it's an intake manifold or an exhaust manifold, you have to use the high temperature. The regular stuff won't work. It'll just turn to it'll just turn to like cement. Okay, so don't do that. Now, Magna Pan, my friend Magna Pan Bob, um, I mentioned him in a few videos. Uh, Bob from uh, MagnaRisers.com. He says, "Hey, uh, can you do something? You know, tell me something about tools for uh, redoing windows on my boat." Because uh, he's buying a new boat, and he wanted to see what kind of trouble he was going to have, you know, redoing the windows. Well, the thing with boat windows is there's a lot of tools. And the reason why is there's a lot of different windows on a lot of different boats. They all have a different style of, of window and how they're seated in there. Um, to start with, though, the one thing you want to have is a knife. Because if there's paint, you want to carve the paint out so it doesn't chip and leave green flakes when you remove the window. So you carve it out. Also, the caulk seam. Some people will caulk the outside of the window, which really is only a temporary fix. Boats are always flexing. Windows are always flexing. If you have a window leak, you really can't caulk it from the outside. It's only going to last maybe a month or so, if you're lucky. Um, especially if you're using your boat constantly or you're living on it out at sea, that's not going to last a week. You really have to re-bed the window. So carve out any of the old paint. Uh, just a small little line all the way around the window. You can use that or an exacto knife. You should always have one of these on the boat uh, for millions of reasons. And keep sharp blades too. But you want to carve out, you know, your line around the paint or the caulk, and then remove the frames because it depends on how it was seated in there. Some windows and some old boats were just glass stuffed in a fiberglass hole and then there was two metal rings, one on the inside, one on the outside, and those bolted together and supported the window from going in either direction. And a bead of caulk. So you got to have one of these. I recommend small and a wide. The wider the area of this knife is, the putty knife, the less damage you're going to do when you're trying to poke this through, okay? You won't have all those millions of little lines from using a one inch. So use a four inch going around the window. Another thing you want to have, because you're usually fixing your, at, at the dock side, you're usually at a marina or a dock, you're usually not in the middle of the Pacific when you're fixing a window. So you want to have a heat gun, because you might need this to soften up some of the material in there. If they used bedding compound, that stuff does not move until it gets hot. Okay, And if it's black, it's better. Um, I've seen that black stuff get really loose just even in sunlight, you know, it'll just weaken right up. So that's another thing. Uh, one thing I did mention too <clears throat> in the other series, um, yeah, this isn't really tool related, but um, the screws. I mentioned uh, the filister screws and somebody wrote to me and said, what's a filister screw? Well, the filister screw they used to use on machinery and automotives, tractors, trucks, and everything way back in the 30s and 40s and 50s, and you can still get them today. And they're, you'll still see them on boats, especially on water pumps. And what they are is they're a bolt with a very tall head, and they have a screw fitting in. This one's a straight. They make them in a Phillips, too. A Phillips, I think, is better. But they have a really tall head on them. And the reason I suggest these, if you have pan head screws, like these, and they round out, you really don't have anything to grip on with a pair of vice grips or channel locks or anything to get this screw back out. One of the beauties of the Philister screws, and they do not come, I have not found them in stainless steel, especially 316, which you really want on an offshore boat. Um, I would suggest replacing water pump screws and anything that needs constant maintenance with this type of screw because when you strip this out, you still have all this headroom to grab the bolt again with a pair of channel locks, vice grips, stud pullers will grab these. Um, there are other tools you can use, uh, the um, spring-loaded um, spanner wrenches will grab these, um, even a, a small pipe wrench. There's a lot of things that will grab these. So if you can find filister screws and a lot of marine suppliers will have them um, and regular bolt suppliers. So if you can find a supplier of nuts and bolts, Hardware stores very rarely carry these, and I've had that issue in the past. I've had to order a lot of mine off, offline or from my uh, bolt distributor. I have one in Cleveland that I used um, uh, very religiously, and they are usually able to get me anything I ever need. 
for the boat, and that's one of them. That's a good thing to have. This is also, going back to the window, this is another nice thing to have. This is a artist <coughs> trawl for mixing like um, oil paints or acrylics maybe. Uh, but this is another thing to get inside, caulk seams and round windows. Really good to have. You can put a little bit of heat on these too, not much. Um, but I use this one for taking necks off of guitars, you know, so you just heat it up a little bit and it will just go in and cut the glue seam. So these might be good for windows too. <clears throat> Excuse me. And again, I'm going to plug the Super Lou. This stuff is really good for wenches. I really like it. It's held up. Um, and I use this on a lot of things. Always carry grease too, a really good waterproof grease. And something without too much dye as far as color goes. Uh, because if you do have to use it topside somewhere, or on a piece of hardware, or on an old turnbuckle, you know, you don't want that dripping and leaving black stains all over the deck. It would really be bad, especially if you have a newer boat. And if at all possible, in those cases, use a dry lubricant. Now, a dry lubricant uh, is really good to have, but if you don't have one, in the, in the poor man's method, or my method, saving on the micro budget that I do, I scrape up old pencils. Now, I find old pencils that are already down too far to sharpen anymore, and I save those. And what I do is I take a razor knife, and I cut them open, and I scrape out the um, graphite center of the pencil. And that makes great lubricant for your turnbuckles. Um, and it doesn't block the uh, metal, you know, from the oxygen. It won't go into, like, uh, what is it, nitrogen starvation or oxygen starvation, um, in crevice corrosion, all that stuff is kind of slightly eliminated because there's no standing um, water or standing uh, grease blocking the metal from the oxygen. So the dry lubricants are really great in that location, and I love to use it on the hinges. So I have most boats, and my own is included, the, all the doors and all the panels inside the boat pull right off. They're just, they just lift right off the hinges when they're open. And those lube up really great with a dry lubricant like the graphite. Now it is black, you don't want to step in it because it would be just like penciling on your deck. Um, so you want to do it carefully, you know, put a towel down or a rag down when you, when you, when you use it. Uh, but nine times out of 10, it just, it does not cause a mess, you know, if you're careful. And it quiets things down and it's, it lasts forever. I use it for all the opening and closing knives too, and pliers. Uh, I like to use it inside my, um, the real well-made pressed pliers. Uh, you can use that in there. There's a lot of a lot of uses for it. So you know, if you have any, a bunch of old pencils around, don't throw them away. You know, you can scrape out the graphite and use it as a uh, really good lubricant. And I think now we can go down to the lab. There's nothing else here to go over. And I don't think there is. Oh yeah, there is one more thing. I wanted to mention this too because uh, actually, there's two more things. Uh, this is good to have. A small can. I wouldn't suggest a big one like this. Get yourself a couple of cans of very high metallic silver or gold paint. You can use the copper too, it doesn't really matter. Those contain metal fragments and lots of them. That metallic in there is usually aluminum, and sometimes bronze, depending on what color you get. That is an amazing emergency gasket material. And you can spray hot surfaces with that. I used to use that on race bikes, on motorcycle uh, Racing, racing motorcycles on the heads. We would take the heads off all the time, scrape carbon out and whatnot, and we could spray it down with silver paint, throw it back together, torque it down, and it was a great gasket that would never leak. So if you're in an emergency and you got to throw a water pump and you're out at sea and you're changing your water pump out at sea and you don't have a gasket, this stuff will work, uh, especially with the heat. Uh, you spray this on, try not to get it onto anything else, just the gasket surface. And that's the trick. You got to have it just on the gasket surface. Now, um, freshwater pumps, be careful. You want to use a thin coat and you want to get it just on the gasket surface because it can get and start eating away at the rubber impeller. And most of the freshwater pumps have a very thin gasket on the cover. If you use too thick of a gasket or too much paint, you'll actually lose water pressure because now you have too big of a gap between the wall, the cap, and the rubber impeller. 
So be very careful how you use that. If you have to do an emergency and you do not have a gasket, spray that on very lightly and you know put tape down or whatever you can, a piece of cloth, a piece of paper, anything to keep the center of the panel clear. Just the gasket surface is all you want to use this on. You can actually spray old gaskets too if you have to use them twice. Those are usually on a head gasket too. I mean, I'm certain that not too many people are going to be pulling the head off their engine in the middle of a seaway. But if you did, this could be sprayed on the gasket, put back down there. You could torque it by hand. You don't need a torque wrench. Just be very even. Cross hatch pattern your torque and be very even. You should, if you're a mechanically inclined at all, you'll have a feel for where you should be in that torque range. Um, it's highly not recommended to do that kind of work at sea, but if you have to, this is a good gasket surface. Okay. Another one is hammers. We talked about this briefly, but I wanted to give a quick demo on hammers. You really don't need a claw hammer on that. You're not pulling nails or doing roofing on a boat. Okay. And you're not framing. Okay. So what you want is a good ball peen hammer and not a too big a one, just an average size ball peen hammer for your average workloads. For the big stuff, if you have to remove shafts, repellers, or anything like that, you get yourself a good one. Small hand slice like this. This is worth its weight in gold. And you'll need this at times, especially if there's an emergency and you need to pound some pins out of a mast that's come off the deck and you want to get that mast off the boat. This is the way to do it. And you have to have a mallet of some sort. And I would recommend a lead mallet, but I mean, where are you going to find one? It's also a lot of weight. And they're very expensive. And it's a machinist hammer. I use them a lot on engine work and shafts and propellers and everything else because they don't damage the material. But you can also use these. Now, this one here, um, you could still get this brand. It was a Craftsman. It's not top shelf, but it's average. Uh, Craftsman used to be with Sears and Roebuck, but now you can find the tools anywhere online. They're just at different locations. Now that Sears is going. Uh, one end is rubber, and the other end is a hard plastic. So you have two different surfaces here for hitting, you know, it depends on what you're hitting that you don't want to really mess up and put hammer dents into. And if you're hitting any kind of tubing, piping, or plumbing, you always want to use something very soft because you don't want to bend it or distort it. It has to go back together eventually, and you want it to go back together with integrity. This is the way to do it. Okay. If there's any, if anybody has questions, please write to me or leave a comment in the box. Okay. Um, I like to go over anything that, you know, might have been, uh, if there was any mistake, if I misspoke, or if there's something else that you think I should go over, because obviously these tooling episodes are probably going to continue. There's still more to do on them. And every time I close one down, I find more stuff that, oh, yeah, we should have done this or that. Or somebody will call me up and say, hey, why don't you do it, you know, an episode with this tool and that tool, or demonstrate this. And, okay, we can do that. So if you have any suggestions, you can leave those too, and I really appreciate it. And I guess right now what we'll do is we'll go down to the lab and we'll check out to see um, how the actual hand impact works. I wanted to give a demonstration. Nicole from Saddles and Sales wanted to see how this worked. And I believe that Magna Pan Bob wanted to see how it worked too. So we're going to give them at least a demonstration. If anybody else wants to watch, please stay tuned. Okay, now it's demo time. We're down in the lab, and uh, I'm going to give a quick demonstration of the uh, hand impact. And But before we do that, I wanted to mention one thing, too. And I've got knives. I don't want to get into a long discussion about that, but just really quickly, because I was down in the lab, and there was two knives sitting there. I thought it's a good idea to at least touch base on that. So, first of all, whenever you're sailing, you're obviously going to carry a knife. And I would suggest... Uh, at least a rigging knife, but I don't have mine here to show you. I was inspecting a boat last week. And I left it in somebody's car, uh, so I got to get that back. But the rigging knife is very important. It's stainless steel, doesn't rust. Keep it on a belt loop or somewhere where you can easily get to it. Uh, it should have one blade and a fit, at least. And the rigging knife is the one you'll take with you in a survival situation. So make sure it's always sharp. But make sure the tip is rounded off. It shouldn't have a pointed tip like this. It should not be pointed like that because the chances are you're in a survival situation, you're going to be in a life raft. And you do not want to accidentally ever poke a hole in that raft. So make sure that your rigging knife, keep the fit sharp. 
you're never going to have that out. And it doesn't pull out, you know, on its own. But keep the blade, because you'll be using the blade in the boat, cutting fish or whatever. Uh, so in the survival raft, you do not want a sharp edge or a sharp point on that blade. You do want a sharp edge, but not the point. It should be rounded off. So make sure you have a, a basically look like a sperm whale at the end of the blade. You know, it's a long, contoured end. Um, and you want one that's serrated. Okay, this one's got like a little serrated edge right there. This one's not a real good one. You'd want one bigger with a longer ser uh, serrated edge. And also with a thumb hole. You could get one with a, you usually have a little a thumb hole right here where you can open it one hand. You want a one handed operation because if you're on a harness and you need to cut yourself free, you want one swipe, one hand. All right, if you have to saw through the line, it's the wrong knife double braided line, it should be one cut up to like a half inch. You should have a knife just that sharp. Half inch, one slice, it should be in two. Because you do not want to be harnessed on it. If you're choking or it's wrapped around your arm, you're falling off the back of the boat, you want to cut that line loose, okay? Also, in case of an emergency, this is a camper model, it's really good to have. This is a hatchet, okay? Not a huge call for it on a boat, but if somebody's, you know, ankles wrapped around a sheet or you have an anchor line and you need to get rid of that thing really quick, one chop, it's gone. It's done. Make sure it's always kept sharp and oiled so it doesn't rust. But do not use stainless steel. Your best knives, your best hatchets should be carbon steel. They will rust if they're not taken care of. But they hold a better edge than any stainless steel blade will ever will. Stainless steel looks pretty. Keep it on the boat without, you know, horrible rust stains. But they don't have the same edge. In an emergency situation, you're going to want an edge. So make sure you buy a really good blade. It's nothing to cheap out on. Cheap blades will snap, they'll break, uh, and they do not hold an edge worth of crap. Stay away from stainless except in your rigging knife. Your rigging knife should always be a stainless steel knife. So should your diving knife. If you're a diver, you want a stainless steel knife. This isn't going to do any much good diving. Uh, so stick with a um, regular stainless steel, you know, one piece knife. You don't want an opening knife either for a diving knife. Uh, but make sure that your rigging knife is stainless. Your emergency knife should be a carbon steel blade with a really, really sharp edge. They hold a much better edge. You can almost do surgery with the darn things if it's a good blade. It's a well-made knife. Okay, so now we're going to go into the hand impact and see what we can do with that really quick and give a quick demo. Okay, here is an old screw that we're going to try to get out. Now, I already pre-tested this to make sure that it was tight and it wasn't going to just come out with a screwdriver. This is an old uh, frame cutter. It's a really old antique piece of machinery. Somebody gave it to me. I haven't messed with it yet, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to first size it up. Now, we need to know what size this is, and by looking at it, I can automatically tell, but not everybody could just by looking at that. So there's our two bits. We're going to first test it with a screwdriver. Now, we're going to assume first that it's, we're going to try number two. And we can see the number two is loose in there. And that is a Phillips two. Okay, so it's bigger screw than that. So we're going to try the P3. That's a nice tight fit. I like that. So, okay, now we know that it is, in fact, a size three Phillips screw. So we go to our bits. This is our third number three bit. This is a snap on, so I'm hoping it doesn't shatter. And we fit it right onto the head of this. Okay, now this has two positions it's spring loaded and it can rotate 90 degrees. Okay, so what we want to do, we're taking off, it's going to be left handed counterclockwise. We know that this is a right handed thread. So we want to push down and turn all the way to the left. The spring loaded in here, as you can see, it goes down and back up. That's so when you hit it with the hammer, there's also a slight twist to it automatically. So we push down, go counterclockwise, because again, we're going to go left. We want to turn this counterclockwise. Then what we do is we take a hammer. And I'm going to move the camera just a little bit so we can see this whole operation. We want to hit this. 
turn it with our hand at the same time. The spring is the spring that's built into this thing is going to do a little bit of the action for us, but we still want to put pressure onto it. We don't want to just hold it in place. We want to be turning that counterclockwise as we hit it. Now I may have to edit this because this is going to make a little noise. Now first, before we do that, let me show or at least see how tight this is. Okay, now that's really not coming loose easily. So I should hit this. Ideally, it should come right loose in one hit. And there it is. That's it. Simple as that. You could also tighten them with this. So you could tighten it all the way in to about there. Push down again on the unit. Turn it clockwise. There, it's at the end of its throw right there. You can feel it. Okay? And then you would tap it. That's locked in there very good and tight. And that is it. That is as simple as it gets. Um, if you have any questions about that, you can leave a comment or email me. My emails are all listed on all the videos. Um, so feel free to get a hold of me. And thank you for watching. Please comment and subscribe to our channel.